Welcome to the ARDS presentation. So the thing that's different about ARDS versus anything else that we've covered so far is this is a syndrome. So you can get ARDS from many different things. It's not its own thing like asthma is or emphysema or anything like that. It's a syndrome and we'll get more into that here. But uh, this is something where you have a bunch of conditions that lead up to what's known as ARDS. So let's get into it. So ARDS used to have a lot of former names like Da Nang Lung, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now pay attention to when it says pulmonary edema here, uh, especially non-cardiogenic, because remember with ARDS, uh, this is a syndrome, and one of the big things with ARDS is it has a lot of trouble. You have a lot of trouble getting oxygen from inside your lung to inside your alveoli. So that's that A to A gradient, or that A to A ratio, or that you're looking at there. And so that's when your, your PF ratio, your A to A ratio, your A to A gradient start becoming very important calculations when you're getting into ARDS. So here's the big thing. If you plan on working in adult critical care medicine, then I strongly suggest you become an ARDS disease, not disease, syndrome uh, expert, because this is gonna help you so much more than just knowing the buttons on the ventilator or how to give a nebulizer. This is gonna help you differentiate you from what a computer can do, right? And so the more you know about the disease process and the different idiosyncrasies within it, then you'll be able to treat the patients that much more effectively and you'll be that much more valuable to the care team as well. Right? So one of the big things that goes along with this is you do have a pulmonary edema component, right? We're still on this alternate name part up here, but you still have that pulmonary edema component to this. And so when we're looking at ARDS, you can have a patient that comes back from the OR. So here's my example. I had a patient go to the operating room. They were they had very low blood pressure in the operating room and they gave them a lot of fluids, a lot of IV fluids. So they gave them five liters of normal saline. That's a lot of fluid to give someone, right? To boost their blood pressure, to help the perfusion to their kidneys, so on and so forth. So they gave them a lot of fluid. And when this patient came back on the ventilator, of course, because they weren't so stable, uh, they came back to the ICU on the ventilator, and I received this patient from the from the surgical staff, and they're really, really hard time getting oxygen into this patient's bloodstream, right? Her saturations were very, very low. Her PO2 was low. Uh, her lung compliance was very low. Her lungs were stiff as far as I could feel, right? And as much pressure as the machine was taking to deliver the breath. And so she was in... A pulmonary edema, that non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, because they gave her a lot of vascular volume. Some of that volume seeped out of her vascular spaces and included seeping into her respiratory zone, into her alveoli, right? And so that caused that non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And so everything about her presentation looked like ARDS because I had trouble getting oxygen in there. Her lungs were very hard to ventilate right? But here's the thing that differentiates pulmonary edema, just straight old pulmonary edema from ARDS, uh, is it will resolve very quickly usually as long as we start treating it. And so pulmonary edema is a component of ARDS, but understand that they are not synonymous, right? So one of the things in this syndrome is pulmonary edema and we're talking about non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema right so the heart cannot be a cause of the patient's oxygenation issues and so that non-cardiogenic part becomes big so nowadays we they used to do a swan catheter and look at the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and if it was uh, greater than 18, then that was a sign that they had left ventricular failure and therefore um, uh, that would be conclusive that it more cardiogenic deoxygenation than it was um, actual ARDS. So they don't do that nowadays. Nowadays we just use this thing called an echocardiogram, look at cardiac function. Uh, so that's the way we can look at it a lot faster, a lot easier without putting an invasive line in. Uh, used to call it oxygen pneumonitis, right? 
uh, wet lung, post-traumatic pulmonary insufficiency. So it used to have a lot of different names, but the reason why I make a big thing in Da Nang is from Vietnam. Um, so some of your military uh, uh, people would probably recognize that. Um, so that's something that they've seen during a war as well. And so just understanding that there's a lot of stuff that can lead into it. And that's why it had so many different names at one point. So what it is ultimately is a response to some sort of injury, whether it's a direct injury, like an inhalation of a toxic gas, or it could be result as a massive systemic body inflammation like we see in sepsis where you have this blood infection that causes your whole body to become inflamed and swollen, right? So this is something where you have an issue that your body is responding to an injury, whether it's directly to your lungs like we see with an inhalation injury or secondary where it's from a systemic injury, right? I had a patient, uh, I had a lot of patients with this, but uh, I had a patient and he was uh, thrown from, he was unbelted. He was thrown from his windshield of his car off of a bypass onto the area below and multiple broken bones on this, this man's body. Um, and he went into severe ARDS. Well, it wasn't because his lungs had, his lungs did have contusions and he had a couple of broken ribs here and there, but it was the systemic inflammation. Once that kicked in, that's when his lungs went downhill because that systemic inflammation includes cellular inf inflammation of your legs will still travel through the bloodstream, right? And attack your lungs as well. So they had that secondary inflammation of his lungs and that's when he went to severe, severe ARDS. The awesome thing about these type of situations is this patient was in such severe ARDS. We ran out of evidence-based ways to treat him. Uh, we were able to come up with a care plan. Thank goodness trauma was very graceful to suggestions. And uh, later that guy was able to go to a, uh, a nursing facility and get weaned off the ventilator at a nursing facility. And then I think a month after he was weaned off the ventilator and still in rehab he walked through our icu with crutches and and that was just part of his recovery and was able to bring us like cookies and say thank you to all of us in the icu it's a pretty cool story but ards is a very very bad syndrome and it can be caused by direct insult or systemic insult so inhalation injury like we see with uh covid 19 right that that inhalation viral pneumonia type stuff uh like we'd seen back in the days of swine flu and all that stuff so that's a direct injury or indirect or aspirating vomit like that would be a direct injury or insult or indirect where it would be secondary to systemic inflammation like in a sepsis patient so with this response to injury, the pulmonary capillaries become enlarged and the alveolar capillary membrane becomes more permeable, which leads to pulmonary edema, right? So this is part of the edema that we see as this. So that's why pulmonary edema can be confused greatly with ARDS. So initially they're going to present very similarly. And so there are some things where we just look at, hey, what's been going on with this patient? Have they been getting lots of fluids? Are, is their heart functioning appropriately, especially their left side of the heart functioning appropriately? So that's where we'll order an EKG and uh, ultrasound or echocardiogram right and we'll look at the heart function and try to rule out that and then we'll also on the echo look at vascular volume we can see the compressibility of the vena cava and see if they're uh, dry or if they're hypervolemic right especially when we're looking at things like their blood pressure so it's going to look a lot like a pulmonary edema because that is an aspect of ARDS right this can also lead to alveolar hemorrhaging. That's right. Red blood cells start to bleed. Uh, uh, and then there's a, a, a something called diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging, DAH. And I think we might have covered it before in a previous class. If not, we'll cover it in a future class for sure. Uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging is something that we can look for on bronchoscopy where we put saline down, we do a bronchial alveolar lavage. So we, we wedge the scope and we push a bunch of saline down, we suck it back up and then we're gonna see blood. And if the blood gets darker, then we know uh, that it's hemorrhaging. If the blood gets lighter or less pink with subsequent pools, 
then we know that it's not alveolar hemorrhaging. So we can actually look for this at the bedside, which is pretty cool. And we'll still send those samples, even though visually we could see a difference one way or another, we'll still send those samples uh, to look at exact numbers on it, of course. Um, so with this, you're going to see pulmonary edema and hemorrhage. You're going to have a lot of consolidation, right? So alveolar hemorrhaging and consolidation. Do, this sounds like the lungs are just bleeding and hemorrhaging from the inside, and that's exactly what's going on. Now, when this happens, because you're adding a bunch of extra fluid, what do you think happens with your surfactant? Does it stay nice and healthy or does it get diluted, right? It decreases and dilutes alveolar surfactant. So therefore you're gonna have atelectasis, right? Alveolar collapse with this, right? So now not only do we have pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary edema, and we have atelectasis added onto this whole thing. All right, so now we have a bunch of things going on. Hey, we're not done yet. There's more, right? They're going to become filled. Uh, the walls are going to be lined with thick, rippled, hyaline membrane. So this is very similar to what they, what babies have. It used to be called HMD, hyaline membrane disease. Now it's known as RDS. Uh, so that's something that when we get to the neoped, uh, neonatal area, we'll talk a lot about RDS, but uh, that's what we're looking at here, separate from there. Um, so when we're looking at this highlight membrane form, forms, right? So this has a bunch of five, um, highlight membrane that's forming. So this is literally forming scar tissue or tearing tissue that highlight membrane is forming in their respiratory zone. Well, this is a bad thing because is scar tissue very pliable, very stretchy? Absolutely not. Scar tissue is very rough and tough and does not want to move, right? That's the whole point of a scar is to heal something up so that way it doesn't move. It's not as weak anymore. And so this means the respiratory zone becomes stiffer. Their lung compliance decreases right it's harder to push that breath in it's harder to expand that lung tissue which makes that alveolar collapse or the atelectasis even more severe Whew. okay so so far we have pulmonary edema and we have pulmonary hemorrhaging and we have atelectasis now we have scar tissue forming right we're not done yet <laughs> Cellular debris, right? A bunch of cellular debris uh, is going to develop, and this is going to be very pus like. Very, very pus like. So, literally, the alveoli not only filling with blood and fluid, they're also filling with cellular debris that's very similar to pus. And so, we got this sick, infected stuff that's being thrown up into the alveoli. It's very, very bad. And the alveoli itself, does it sound like it's going to clear it very easily? No, it's going to trap it in there because we got atelectasis and scar tissue forming that's going to keep it down in the respiratory zone. So now we have this alveoli that's getting filled up with a, just a ton of different stuff. How easy is it going to get oxygen in from, through the alveoli into the blood vessel? It's going to be very, very difficult for sure. Not only that, how easy is it going to be to expand that tissue? It's not. It's going to be very, very hard to expand that tissue. And so now we have pus filling up as well. We have scar tissue forming. So the walls of the alveoli are getting thicker. Oh, heavens. So this is just a snowball of craziness, right? Uh, and that fibrin and the exudate develop into alveolar fibrosis, right? Like a form of pulmonary fibrosis, right? This is like a form of it where we're just developing thick, thick scar tissue on the alveoli that's causing lung com compliance to decrease, alveolar collapse. It's going to take a lot of pressure just to get a breath in on these patients. So if you were to actually look at the lung tissue itself, it looks like sort of a piece of uh, red meat or liver. Uh, if you have that mental image in mind, that's exactly sort of what's going on. It's just that beat up, emaciated meat that the lung tissue is becoming. Now, like I said, this can be as a result of a direct trauma to the lungs, like an inhalation injury or secondary injury from something like a, you know, a massive amount of blood infection 
like a sepsis. So it's a very nasty syndrome ultimately. So it's just that hyper reactivity response to a severe insult, whether it's direct or indirect. So this is the picture from your book, and this is looking at your hyaline membrane formation, um, your monocytes, your high, more hyaline membrane formation, scar tissue, all this gunk and pretty much cellular debris filling up, atelectasis. Oh my gosh, there's so many bad things going on with this, right? Macrophages are going all over the place, and so it's part of what's producing your pus that's in there. So your body is just in a massive swollen state here. So here is a big good summary slide. I know I wrote a lot on that first slide there, but a lot of edema and hemorrhage, consolidation, hyaline membrane formation, so scar tissue, right? That's a fancy way of saying scar tissue. Pulmonary surfactant deficiency, abnormality. Well, if the surfactant's diluted, so there's two things going on to this whole thing right? The surfactant's being diluted, right? It's being diluted because of the pulmonary edema, but it's also being suppressed because we're on high FiO2. So if you remember right, when we were in pulmonary AMP, when we talked about FiO2 and surfactant, too low hypoxemia can cause a decrease in surfactant production as well as hyperoxia can cause a decrease in surfactant production. So with all this stuff forming in their lungs, what's going to happen to their blood vessels? Are the blood vessels, are, is there going to be a lot of oxygen getting into their bloodstream? The answer is no, right? And so they'll be hypoxic, which means are they going to produce a lot of surfactant if the body's hypoxic or hypoxemic? Yes, they're they're going to have a reduction in surfactant production because of the hypoxemia. Because because of the systemic hypoxemia, they're going to reduce the amount of surfactant the body is producing. Right? That's no longer a concern of the body. It's like, oh, I don't need to produce surfactant right now. I need to focus on keeping my heart, my brain alive. Right? So it stops sort of sending oxygen and stuff into those other what it considers ancillary areas and focusing on delivering oxygen to the heart, the kidneys, brain, so on and so forth, right? So it's gonna stop surfactant production, right? And then we have surfactant dilution. And then when we're giving higher FiO2s, that's also going to cause a reduction in surfactant production because now you're you have a lot of oxygen that's going to your alveolar type 1 type 2 pneumocytes it's going to be like hey you're giving me a lot of oxygen into my alveoli right and it's only reading your p big ao2 right p big ao2 and so when it's looking at the p big ao2 it's like hey you're giving me a high concentration of oxygen so i don't need to produce a lot of surfactant i'm already getting tons of oxygen it doesn't recognize that that oxygen is not getting into the bloodstream it just sees its own cells in the alveoli right it's being selfish it just sees its own cells in the alveoli getting lots of fio2 and it says i'm good i'm going to stop producing surfactant to try to help counter all this too much oxygen that I'm getting, right? So the higher the FiO2s we use on patients, the more likely we are not only to diminish the mucociliary escalator, right? We talked about the cilia not liking too much oxygen as well, but now we're also reducing the amount of surfactant that the patient's producing on their own. And so this is diluted by FiO2, right? It's diminished by FiO2, it's diminished by their um, dilution of the pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage. So there's a lot of stuff going on that's causing that atelectasis that's, that's fighting us overall with having a patient that has very compliant, very healthy lung tissue. And the more you get rid of this or dilute the, the surfactant, the worse the lung injury becomes. Because, hey, what happens if you go and you take drain all the oil out of your car's engine? Is it going to run very smooth for very long, right? We're talking about surfactant being like oil in a car's engine. It needs that to help lubricate the movement of tissue. Otherwise, scar tissue develops. So now we're going to have a lung injury because we don't have the proper amount of surfactant in there. Very, very poor situation going on. Of course, atelectasis goes along with this. Uh, so ARDS has been around for a long time. It was known by different names 
Um, it was mostly known uh, during the military in World War II. That's where they first sort of seen this syndrome start to develop with, with shock lung or trauma. Um, that was the big thing that they would notice with this. So if you plan on working, like I said, acute care medicine, down, adult acute care, adult critical care medicine down the road, please be an expert in ARDS, please. All right, you will, you will thank me later on that. Just trust me on that. Um, it was pretty, pretty, it's a pretty disgusting situation that's going on. All right, the big thing that goes along with this syndrome is you have several days of hypoxemia, right? Remember, we can't get stuff into that bloodstream. We have all the scar tissue, all this hemorrhaging, all this edema developing in here, right? So that hypoxemia slowly develops over days, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So this is just a massive shunting of blood that goes through there, right? And we... Because they're they're unable to get a good diffusion through the AC membrane, we're gonna have to use high FiO2s, which make the situation worse. But we have to use high FiO2s so that way they don't have a hypoxic brain injury or have their organs start to shut down. So the greater risk and benefit when we look at it, there's more benefit than risk by giving them high FiO2s because we need their brain to survive, right? You need their kidneys to survive, you need their heart to survive, and those need oxygen to survive. And so if we don't give them oxygen, they'll go into a metabolic acidosis, and then eventually the patient will go into multi-organ system failure. And that's what most patients of ARDS die of. They don't die of pulmonary insufficiency, they die of multi-organ system failure. It's pretty crazy. So one of the big things with ARDS patient care is making sure that their organ systems stay up and running as much as possible. Now, we don't expect them to be running perfectly. I don't expect perfect kidney function. I don't expect not, seeing, not to see an arrhythmia here or there because of the hypoxemia, right? I sort of expect that a little bit, but I want to make sure that those systems are at least running. It's when those systems shut down that that patient has a very uh, poor prognosis. I hope that makes sense. All right, so several days of hypoxemia. Usually they'll be on very high oxygen concentrations. You'll see infiltrates develop. They'll, you'll hear crackles when you auscultate and this will be continuous throughout the respiratory zone. And we'll look at, I have CT scans in this presentation as well as x-rays, and you'll hear crackles, just that popping sound throughout the respiratory cycle. Usually, uh, these are the type of patients that they'll be on a non-rebreathing mask or high oxygen mask, right? Uh, a mask that delivers high amounts of oxygen. They'll cough, and they'll desaturate from 93% to 83% just by coughing. That's how sick their lung tissue is, right? You and I, we cough. Will our SATs change? Probably not, right? Unless we had this going on. But that's what we're looking at here. Their lungs are so sick, even just coughing can desaturate them pretty severely. Um, so it's a pretty big, fragile situation that's going on with these patients. And a lot of times you might see severe hypoxemia start to develop, right? That's why that PO2 is something important to look at on their blood gases. Most patients uh, survive the initial course, begin to show auction improvements, decreasing infiltrates over the next several days. So this is as long as we're supportive and we're treating the underlying cause, like the sepsis, right? What if we're treating the sepsis? If we're treating the sepsis, then they should start recovering, their lungs should start getting better. All right, so what puts someone at risk for ARDS, right? There are a lot of things. <laughs> I'm not going to make you memorize them, but there are more than 60 ways to get it. I know, this sounds amazing, right? You're like, tell me more about how I how I can avoid this. Well, there's a lot of ways to avoid it, but uh, yeah, the most common cause is this blood infection, sepsis. The most common cause of ARDS is sepsis. So ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so this is the most common cause, that blood infection. So someone comes in, they're massive fever, uh, vasodilated, so they're hypotensive. Um, we're gonna put in a central line, usually look at venous sats and venous um, 
uh, pressures and all that stuff, uh, this is going to be your most common cause of ARDS. So being aware of the signs and symptoms of sepsis, not something we'll cover in this course, but being aware of the signs and symptoms of sepsis can help clue you in to this patient could possibly have a course that leads to ARDS, and therefore we should institute lung protective ventilation, things like that, early on. So sepsis is the most common cause. That sounds like a good test question. So sepsis is the most common cause of ARDS. Uh, close behind it, aspiration. This is a very common cause because we'll have patients, especially that aspirate vomit, they get in a bar fight and they get knocked out and they aspirate on their own vomit or uh, a patient's on non-invasive ventilation and they vomit into their CPAP, right? They vomit into their mask and it pushes that vomit deep into their lungs. So aspiration can easily lead into an ARDS as well. Very high, uh, ish, very, very high probability of ARDS with aspiration, especially vomit. Uh, pneumonias can easily lead into it. So if you have your viral pneumonias, like we see with COVID or we've seen with the swine flu, right? That's something that we had to pay attention to big time with those patients because they would go into that viral pneumonia would easily lead into an ARDS situation, right? Uh, severe trauma, like I talked to you guys about with both a direct insult where we had, let's say we had someone with flail chest that had a really big crush injury and the lung got contused, that could easily lead into a ARDS situation. Or like I talked to you about that gentleman that flew through the windshield off the bypass, right? Severe body inflammation that led to it. So a lot of issues can lead to it, especially with severe trauma. So if you work at a level one trauma center or you're seeing a trauma patient wherever you're working, this is something that should be in the back of your mind. If their lung compliance starts to decrease, right, it starts to take a lot of pressure to get a normal breath into their lungs, then you know that this patient has a chance of developing ARDS or is developing ARDS. Uh, if they have a massive blood transfusion that's cold, and I think I talked to you guys about that during the, the pulmonary edema presentation. Remember we talked about how cold things expand, right? You put ice in an ice cube tray and put it in the fridge, and that and when you come back that level's higher because ice expanded right so if you have cold blood that it's a larger red blood cell it's more likely to tear through the thin capillary membrane that's in your lungs which then leads to ARDS right that cold transfusion so that's why we want to make sure we're giving them as warm as blood as we can not like microwave hot blood but just make sure we warm it up before we give it to them uh, lung or hepato um, stem cell transplant uh, drug abuse we'll see this with drug abuse for sure their body's going through massive inflammation same thing with transplantation massive inflammation that's why these people will be on steroids after transplantations uh, to help reduce inflammation and rejection and, and all the stuff that the body's going through. Uh, central nervous system complications like ICP issues. So if you work in a neuro ICU, right, uh, especially at a place like Swedish, right, where we had a lot of neuro patients there, uh, that if they have high intracranial pressures, that's the ICP there, if they have high intracranial pressures, their body can be releasing chemotoxins their body can be releasing cellular mediators of inflammation which that can easily go into the lungs right and start attacking the lung tissue cause ARDS if someone's on cardiac bypass for a prolonged time frame I'm not talking about an hour right we're talking about a prolonged time frame they're not getting a lot of blood flow through their lungs and their heart right those are deflated especially if they're on uh, VA ECMO where it bypasses the heart and the lungs that's going to be an issue because now they're that area is not getting fresh new blood fresh nutrients fresh oxygen and so especially your lungs remember the respiratory zone does not have a separate blood flow to the wall of the alveoli to nourish the alveoli. The type 1 pneumocytes are nourished. They steal their nourishment from the blood that's going through the AC membrane. Now, they don't require a lot of nourishment, but they do require nourishment, right? Hopefully you get that, right? And so when we bypass, when we're not sending any blood through the lung tissue, right? We're bypassing the lungs. 
Are we sending any nutrients or nourishment or refreshment to the type 1 pneumocytes, or to the alveoli itself? No, we're not. So then cellular mediators, all those things will start to get released, and that's when that can happen, right? Uh, disseminated uh, intravascular coagulopathy, DIC, right, that bleeds and clots at the same time. Uh, these patients that go into DIC, if you see bruising, then that's one thing. You have to give them platelets. If you see uh, no bruising, then you'll have to give them heparin, and they might be showering pulmonary emboli. DIC is a very sick situation. I wish I had time to go into that one with you guys, too. There should be like a disease class number two down the road for you guys. That would be so much fun. For me, anyway. Uh, immunologic reactions, of course, alveolar reactions uh, can easily happen and go into this situation as well. Oxygen toxicity. We're talking FiO2 is greater than 60.6 uh, or 60% if you're looking at it as a percent, not a fraction. Um, so oxygen toxicity, that's why we try to keep FiO2 is less than 60 uh, or 60% 60 oxygen. We try to keep them under that if we can. So on your board exams, currently, as of recording this, uh, they they constantly do what's called the 60-60 rule. So if they're on 60% oxygen and their oxygen levels are low in their bloodstream, then you're supposed to increase the amount of pressure that we're giving them to help re-expand lung tissue. We try not to go above 60% if we don't have to, uh, according to the NBRC hospital. So that's something just to be aware of there. So we try to keep their FIO2s less than 60% or less if we can. All right, bedside evaluation. What will this patient look like? Hopefully, by now, you've gotten sort of a mental picture that they will not look healthy. This is a very unstable condition, right? Uh, usually appear between 6 to 72 hours of the event. So you might have a patient on a ventilator for 24, 48 hours and then start to notice that they're developing crackles. They're starting to breathe faster their heart's going faster, they're starting to sweat, they're working harder to breathe, even though they're on a ventilator, right? So I've seen this happen, trust me. So initially their lung compliance is gonna look perfect, they're gonna look fine, and then as the inflammation keeps kicking in and kicking in and kicking in, as they go through that spiral of inflammation, that's when you're gonna start to notice some of the stuff kick in, between six and 72 hours of the event, right? So like I gave the example of that gentleman that was thrown through the windshield off the bypass, he he didn't have it for the first two, three days. He was fine on the ventilator, but it was that third day that he started getting worse and worse and worse. And that's when we started running out of options on how to run his ventilator. And that's when we sort of came up with an alternate plan. Uh, he made it, like I said, uh, so obviously crackles from the atelectasis, from the inflammation, from the from the fluid that's going on, you're going to hear that continuously throughout the respiratory cycle. Um, bron bronchial breath sounds, remember bronchial is that deep tone, that bass note um, breath sound, and that's because of the inflammation that's going on and consolidation. Very dull percussion note because remember we have a lot of consolidation going on with this. X-rays, oh my gosh, X-rays on this one. A lot of opacities, right? GGO, so ground glass opacities is going to be your big thing. It'll usually be throughout the lung. It can be more centrally located. It can be more um, lobe, lobe specific in certain situations. So let's say someone aspirates vomit. Well, because of the anatomy of the lungs, most of that will go into the right lower lobe. And so you might see more ground glass opacities more uh, more density in that right lower area. Now, let's say someone gets a viral pneumonia, right? Like we've seen with the swine flu, like we've seen with COVID. Uh, when we're looking at that, that's a very spread out. It's all throughout the, lo the lobes, the segments, right? It's, it's gonna be more pan lobular of an experience. And so you're going to usually see that ground glass opacity all throughout. And we'll, we'll look at x-rays, and I have some CTs as well to show you here. So you're going to see what's known as an infiltrate. Infiltrate, remember, a fancy word if you go back to the x-ray evaluation uh, PowerPoint. 
that I recorded for you guys. The uh, infiltrate is just a fancy word of, hey, there's something white there, and we don't know if it's mucus. We don't know if it's swollen tissue. We don't know if it's a foreign object. We just know something is there. So something is infiltrating that area. So it's a very nonspecific umbrella term. So don't read too much into the word infiltrate. It just means something's there, right? That shouldn't be there. Um, so they're going to have a lot of opacity or, or white uh, or white density that shows up in ARDS, right? Increased density uh, usually shows increased opacity. That's what I just said. The more severe, the denser the lungs will appear. They're going to become more ground glass, more ground glass. It'll get worse and worse and worse. So let's look at some of these. So I believe this one's from your book, and this is just a patient with moderately, right, moderately severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. You're like, how can it be moderately and severe? We'll go over that. Just not right now, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. How do we do mild, moderate, severe here, right? And there's an equation for this. And you're like, yay, an equation. I love Derek and his equations. So when we're looking at this, this is a moderately severe ARDS picture. So obviously you see this is more radio opaque than normal. Uh, and so you see how it looks like someone just crushed a bunch of glass and just put it all over the lung tissue. So obviously it's more radio dense, or, or yeah, it's more ra it's more dense, so therefore it's more uh, opaque in its appearance, and it just looks like it. This is diffuse. It's bilateral. You see a lot of issues here where there's just massive amount of atelectasis, especially in that right. You'll also see more collapse, and you can even see this whole right lower lobe there, and that's that fissure, right, that you're seeing there. Just that collapse, and you just see how cloudy and hazy and foggy, right? It looks like a bunch of fog is in there. Just all this cloudy, hazy stuff that's going on. Diffuse, bilateral, pretty severe issue overall. So when we're looking at this, one of the things, and we'll talk about this in the treatment area. I know I'm sort of jumping a little bit, but we're in the radiography area, and that's why I wanted to put this in here, is we'll be looking at something called prone ventilation. And we talked a little bit about this in pulmonary AMP, how you have much more segments posteriorly and laterally than you do anteriorly. So on the right, you're going to see a CT scan. So... Here is the patient's spine at the 6 o'clock position, right? And then their sternum would be at the 12 o'clock position up here. And so remember these are mirrored images. So this is actually the left lung and this is actually the right lung. And you see the heart on the more towards the left side here. And you see how the right main stem bronchus is more of a direct circle versus an oval for the left main stem, right? Remember the right main stem's at 25 degree and the 40 to 60 on the left, right? So those are some of the landmarks just so you sort of see where we're at. Now when we're looking at ARDS, remember this massive alveolar hemorrhage, consolidation, scar tissue, all this bad stuff that's really impeding the ability for the lung tissue or the respiratory zone to expand. Remember, we're not talking about the tracheobronchial tree here. We're talking about the respiratory zone. So now you see all this collapse, right? Do you see this? And even the descending aorta, right? You see all this collapse that's going on. That's pretty massive. And then where do you see more density? In the bases, right down towards the spine? Or do you see more density in the apices up here? Right? It's more dense in the bases. That's where most of that collapse is happening. Well, where do you think you get more perfusion? If you have more segments in your posterior areas, where do you think there's bigger blood vessels and more perfusion going? To those areas. So I have more surface area and more perfusion in my posterior segments and my lateral segments than I do in my anterior segments. So when we're ventilating this patient and this patient is laying supine on the bed, gas is going to go the path of least resistance, which is going to be up here, right? Is there a lot of collapse up there? No. And in fact, we see over distension over here. Do you see me highlighting this area in the right lobe? 
you see this over distension this destruction of tissue that's going on so we're giving this patient lots of pressure because we need to expand their lungs and what we're really doing is we're not expanding the area that's down here that needs to expand we're actually over expanding and causing a ventilator induced lung injury to these anterior segments so we're actually making this patient worse is there a lot of good blood flow here no poor blood flow to the anterior segments uh, and we have overexpanded tissue that's not going to help either so uh, what we're having here is low surface area low perfusion which is going to mean our ability to oxygenate this patient is going to be very poor so here's the science we have this pa patient and that's what you're looking at over here that supine if we flip them on their belly and put them in prone position right we flip them over and we put them prone we're going to have a lot better perfusion because remember most of your segments are posteriorly and laterally located just from pulmonary MP, right? We have a lot more segments. And so this tissue that's collapsed and closed down is actually gonna stretch out, right? This tissue now stretches and opens up. So now I'm getting better ventilation as well as perfusion to this area will increase because now I've re-expanded that lung tissue. Therefore, more blood flow can flow through there. So I have a much better what we call VQ match. I have a lot better ventilation to perfusion ratio when we put someone in prone position. So that's what you see down here, right? All this whole area is collapsed. Then we flip them over and this whole area opens up and then our VQ match increases. In other words I'm able to get oxygen and ventilation done on this patient more effectively without using as much FiO2 without using as much volume without as much pressure and without a risk of causing trauma or ventilator induced lung injury I hope this makes sense so just simply by flipping someone over and I just want to show you that simply by flipping someone over, we're optimizing the ventilation perfusion ratio of just pulmonary anatomy that helps avoid further lung damage and actually can help them help us titrate how much oxygen and how much pressure we're using to ventilate them. So that's why we have a lot better situation where we'll take someone whose PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is 50 and we'll flip them over to prone position and now their VQ ratio is 150 or ventilation to uh, P big A, P little A to P big A, uh, A to A ratio is now way, way better, right? because just flipping them over using pulmonary anatomy, right? We're not doing anything fancy, we're just putting them on their stomach. And now, since we did that, just knowing anatomy, just knowing pulmonary AMP, we're able to actually optimize this patient, turn down how much oxygen we're using, turn down how much pressure we're using, and therefore help their body recover better without causing any more damage. What's the Hippocratic Oath? right first do no harm and here you're seeing this patient develop a ventilator induced lung injury right are we doing harm to this patient absolutely so here's a different picture and I linked this to in your resources tab a link to the respiratory care journals like overview of prone ventilation it is a very good very interesting read that's something to save and put in your locker when you guys go to mechanical ventilation and go work out in the field it is a very good update so please look at that link in the resources tab and it covers this and that's where I took uh, this slide from so this is looking at lungs this is the CT scan once again of lungs with ARDS um, and so they're looking at the top the patient is supine right they're on their spine and then on the bottom in C and D they're prone right we put them belly down or chest down right so we're looking at uh, what it looks like when they're on their spine versus when they're down, right? So image A was taken at exhalation in the supine position, right? Do you see the massive amount of atelectasis in their, in their, their bases there, in their posterior segments, right? Just hanging out at the bottom there. 
So it's a lot of atelectasis. That's a lot of alveolar collapse. Image B on the right there is taking an inhalation on the same supine position. So that's that when inhalation exhalation you see how much collapse there is and not much opens up there's a little bit of stuff that opens up between inhalation and exhalation but that repetitive complete collapse and ripping open is called atelic trauma or shearing trauma so atelic trauma is when you have almost like velcro think about velcro when it comes together and it sticks together or hook and loop i should say when it sticks together and then you have to tear it rip right to open it back up again and so that's what's happening every time this person's taking a deep breath the alveoli collapse and they suck themselves into each other right remember they lost their surface tension from everything that's going on and every time that breath is delivered it velcro rips and it pulls and it shears and it causes more trauma more highline membrane formation every time that breath is delivered to those atelectatic areas so that's causing even more trauma right that's very bad when you look at c and d when the patients are flipped over on their stomach when they're in prone position right same tidal volumes right they give this patient the same ventilator settings but do you see how there's a lot better aeration in the posterior segments of the lung do you see that the posterior segments have a lot better aeration not only that but look at the anterior sections which are now dependent right look at the anterior sections near the heart on the patient's uh uh, right lung. So when you're looking down on here, notice that there's a lot more radial lucency, right, compared to the supine position on this patient. So that means not only do we have ventil better ventilation and perfusion, but it's going to be a lot easier to get oxygen into this patient's lungs, uh, into this patient's bloodstream as well. So then we can decrease how much FiO2 we're using. We can decrease how much pressure we're using and therefore avoid a ventilator induced lung injury as well. So not only will it help their body recover, but it'll also help reduce how much, how extreme the settings are on the machine to help avoid a, a ventilator induced injury as well. So hopefully me preaching uh, prone ventilation is going to stick somewhere in your brain. Um, and this is one of the big things that's been helping out a lot of patients besides ECMO out there with, uh, with especially with the COVID situation going on. So prone ventilation is proved. There's multiple studies out there. Uh, it's just gotta be done carefully when looking at it. So this is just two pictures. And this is just, I just wanted you guys to see an actual picture of what it would look like here. And here you see the ventilator over here should look like one that we had in our lab there and you see the patient prone and then you can see this patient's also wearing a uh, ted hose which we talked about in the dvt area that compression socks that help push blood back in there to avoid dvts all that bad stuff but you can see there and then they have the of course the christmas tree of ivs and all that stuff going on with this patient but you can see this patient's prone and it's called swimmer's position that's why one hand's down here the other hand's up there it's like they're swimming um and so that's what that that's just sort of to give you a visual uh image of what it actually looks like when a patient is prone that's in there and then this is just a different picture that's showing the same thing we talked about before when we put patient in there that gravity or the gravitational force it's gonna be a lot more beneficial for their vq match and therefore help oxygenate and ventilate the patient more effectively uh, the big concern about prone patients and there's a couple concerns about there right this isn't risk-free Right, you could lose the central line. You, it could be accidentally extubated. In flipping them over, there's even roto beds where the bed will actually rotate the patient and put them in a prone position and then rotate back to supine again, rotate back and forth. There's a bunch of different ways to look at it. So there is some risk associated with it. The other concern usually has been that what if the patient codes? What if they go into a cardiac arrest? during prone position i mean you can't do compressions through the spine that's not a good idea never don't ever don't ever do that <laughs> so when you're looking at that that's one of the concerns that's out there however since oxygenation usually improves and we're able to actually titrate pressors and and vent settings and fio2s it's not usually as much of a concern as it would have been they would have been more likely to receive cpr and go into that 
cardiac failure in supine than that they would in prone. So uh, a lot more chance of a cardiac arrest in just keeping them supine and not doing anything. So not as much of a risk as what they thought it was. But yeah, coding a patient does or could still happen when they're prone. But if, as long as their oxygenation improves, usually it's not as much of a worry for cardiac arrest there. Okay, <laughs> so the PFT slide. Obviously, that patient, these patients are going to be so sick, so fast, their lungs are going to be so severe. Usually, you're looking at mechanical ventilation on these ARDS patients if they're not already on mechanical ventilation. So why are we talking about pulmonary function tests? Well, not only will it tell you about how the lungs function during the syndrome, but also in the recovery, like that patient I was telling you about before, uh, he spent a long time on the ventilator trying to get his respiratory muscles back strong again, so breathing on his own again after being paralyzed and all that stuff. And it's going to be a while before they get back. And so remember, this is a big restrictive issue. We're forming scar tissue in the respiratory zone. The lungs aren't able to expand because of the edema and the scar tissue hemorrhaging all the bad stuff that's going all that pus that's forming in the respiratory zone just so many different things so when the patients are recovering they can actually do um, pulmonary function testing to sort of see what their level of impairment is and then sort of track trend or track their recovery uh, back to hopefully a baseline of some sort but remember this is restrictive which means your volumes and capacities are going to be decreased. What about your flow rates? Flow rate should be normal unless they had some sort of baseline uh, condition going on. So we're looking at a very restrictive disorder here. Now one thing I want to highlight here, and I hope a ventilator down the road does this, uh, is a DLCO. Uh, their diffusion. Remember we have all this cellular debris, pus, blood, you name it, just forming in here. Now we also have scar tissue so the hyaline membrane gets thicker. So how easy do you think oxygen is going to diffuse into the bloodstream? Yeah it's going to be very very low and so one of my question marks is is if we could ever find a way to do a DLCO on a vented patient, like a single breath, like a breath hold DLCO, we could sort of trend how sick their respiratory zone is Q6 hours or daily or whatever and sort of see where they're trending if they're getting worse or getting better if there's more or less we could do for causing a ventilator induced lung injury or not that's just sort of my down the road dream so draw the dream bubbles and then the picture of me and one day maybe one of you will invent that and you'll be like this is a great idea I drew my bow tie hopefully Anyway, so when we're looking at the DLCO, that's something that would be very decreased. Even in recovery for these patients, it'll be decreased. That scar tissue is there. Now, it doesn't mean they can't recover, right? It just means that they might have some residual effect from that. All right, and ABG and ARDS, if they just started it, that 24 to 72 or 6 to 72 hour range, usually it'll be that respiratory alkalosis, just like all the other conditions we talked about. They have that initial uh, hypoxemia response where they'll get tachycardic, tachypnic, uh, and then they'll breathe faster and they'll be in the alkalosis just to help get more CO2 out of the bloodstream so they get more oxygen into their bloodstream. All right, just like all the other ones. So that doesn't change there. And then, of course, when it gets severe, they'll be in an acute respiratory acidosis. Why did I not comment about their hypoxemia? Well, we'll get into why I didn't comment about their hypoxemia when we're talking about the PF ratio. That's the level of severity of the ARDS, and that's how we currently sort of look at it. So what happens? Of course, this is a shunt-like process, so FiO2 or oxygen is going to be a therapeutic intervention for these patients. DO2 is going to be decreased because CCO2 is decreased, therefore CaO2 is decreased, therefore their DO2 will be decreased because remember, DO2 is cardiac output and CaO2. Uh, metabolic consumption or metabolic rate it's going to say normal here. Now understand, if this patient has an infection like sepsis, then these would be increased. 
All right. So just understand that they have something like a massive infection. They're running up um, a very high fever. Something is going on that's increasing their metabol. They're in a, in a metabolic acidosis, right? Then the consumption rate in the A to B gradient would be increased. Okay. But right now we're not talking massive body infection. We're talking just lungs, right? So in the case of just lungs, those are normal. <laughs> Right, uh, O2ER is increased because DO2 is decreased, and then venous saturation decreased. And this is one of the big things we look at on uh, on these patients. They'll get a central line, and we'll put these in in the emergency department. Someone comes in with sepsis or uh, severe ARDS, they'll put a central line in pretty darn quick, and that's going to be useful for a lot of things. A, we're going to have to give them lots of medicines. B, we can draw venous saturations and, v, and VVGs. So you want venous blood gases because then you can see how much shunting the patient's going through as well. So venous saturations, venous PO2s are going to be very central. They're going to be very helpful in the ARDS patient. Not only that, but we can also see uh, vascular volume, things like that. So central lines are going to be very key when we get into it. Hemodynamics. Okay, so let's look at the right-sided heart pressures. Uh, your CVP is going to be elevated, right atrial pressure. Pul mean pulmonary artery pressure is going to be elevated. Right ventricular stroke work index, so the right side of the heart's working harder. Pulmonary vascular resistance is all going to be increased. So a lot of right-sided heart pressure uh, changes okay so we got tons of right-sided heart pressure the right side of the heart's working really hard a lot of it that you have a hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction because is there a lot of oxygen getting into the blood cells or getting into the blood vessel no so therefore you got hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction causing all of these okay now what about the left side of the heart so left ventricular stroke work index is how hard the left ventricle is working has decreased it's not working as hard cardiac index normal or increase the stroke volume index normal or increase uh, stroke volume normal increase cardiac output normal or increase pulmonary capillary wedge pressure which is the left side of the heart normal or decreased interesting so when we're looking at these, most of the time in the systemic vascular resistance, normal or decrease, we're looking at most likely left-sided heart pressures are normal, right? So we're just going to blanket statement here that we're looking at normals for those, okay? Wedge pressure should not be elevated at all, right? This is actually a key thing. If the wedge pressure is elevated, that's a sign of left ventricular failure, and therefore it may be cardiac failure that's causing this person to have such poor oxygenation and pulmonary edema, right? So their issue would be cardiogenic pulmonary edema, not ARDS, if this was high. But the fact that it's normal or low means it's not left ventricular failure. So a lot of times, and especially when we talk about ARDS, it's a thing of ruling out conditions. All right, so how do we diagnose ARDS? Well, it's usually a diagnosis of exclusion, which means we're going to try to rule out cardiac failure. We're going to try to rule out diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. We're going to try to rule out a bunch of other issues, and it's sort of what's left must be true, right? It's that whole Spock thing, right? If we eliminate all the possibilities, what's left, however impossible, should be the truth, right? So that's what we're doing here. We're excluding all other causes of hypoxic respiratory failure right with infiltration uh, is it cardiogenic pulmonary edema so this is why we look at an ekg this is why we look at uh, an echocardiogram or they put a swan gan not as likely nowadays or they put a swan and look at the wedge pressure so if the wedge pressure is normal or low then we know it's not left ventricular failure if we do a, a echo cardiogram and we see that the left ventricle is functioning just fine then we know it's not cardiogenic pulmonary edema, right? So we rule that out. So we need to rule out any cardiac issues. So in other words, if a patient has a severe cardiac issue, it may not be true ARDS. It might be cardiogenic pulmonary edema that we're looking at on this patient. DH, we already talked about DH. We can rule that out with a bronchoscopy at the bedside. We're going to do uh, BALs, look for 
uh, at least three samples and we're looking at how much red blood cells are in each sample if it's getting worse or better so we need to rule out diffuse alveolar hemorrhaging uh, idiopathic ex uh, acute ex exacerbation uh, pre-existing ILD right if a patient already has an ILD they come in with a viral pneumonia right th it could be something like that so we've got to rule out a pre-existing ILD so that's like a history uh, and physical uh, eosinophilic pneumonias, uh, cryptogenic pneumonias, all right, those necrotizing pneumonias, we talked a little bit about that in ILD, uh, or in pneumonia, sorry, uh, inter acute interstitial pneumonias, right? So we need to sort of rule out any of these other issues before we can sort of say, hey, this is for sure ARDS. So how do we do the Berlin definition? So Usually they have to have symptoms that had uh, no new or worsening within a week, right? So if it, has, it can't have been going on for the past four weeks. They've been having shortness of breath and difficulty breathing, right? That's not acute. That's, that's a more of a chronic thing. So they define acute as a week or less, right? They should have opacities on their x-ray. So a week or less, opacity is on their x-ray, and it can't be explained by things like pleural fusions, or just straight out atelectasis, or nodules, right? we got to make sure that their x-ray, it just shows they have atelectasis, and it's nothing necessarily is causing the atelectasis. So we look for opacities without anything obviously that's causing it. Without anything that's obviously causing their atelectasis, like a pleural fusion or just a collapse from a nodule or something like that. Then we have to look at, is there heart failure or fluid overload? If there's heart failure or fluid overload, then this is pulmonary edema. And it looks like ARDS, but they'll resolve quickly, right? With pulmonary edema, you don't have near as much inflammation. You don't have near as much, uh, you don't have scar tissue being formed. You don't have all this other stuff happening. With this, you do. With ARDS, you do. So that's why we're like, hey, if they just gave them five liters of fluid in the OR, then this is an ARDS. It looks like it, but it's not the same pathophysiology, right? They'll recover quicker from this one, right? So we're just going to rule out heart failure or fluid overload from these patients. Um, so one of the things that we could easily do is just an echo, echocardiography, right? Uh, Monitor to severe impairment. So this is the PF ratio. So, yes, this involves math, and yes, you will be doing this at the bedside in critical care medicine. Uh, PF ratio, this is where you're looking at the severity of their ARDS. And this is what we're talking about with prone ventilation. If their PF ratio is less than 150, then that's an indication to put them from supine to prone, or that's where we can talk about putting them from supine to prone. Now, there's doctors that talk about doing this earlier than later, uh, where their PF ratio is, let's say, 200 or, or 250, right? They'll start doing it earlier before we get lower. So you're just doing the P little AO2 over the FiO2. That's the PF ratio. So nothing crazy, right? Just that simple division, and you're looking at that ratio. So when we're looking at the severity, that's how you do that mild, moderate, severe is that PF ratio. So anything less than 100 is severe. Uh, severe um, AR would be the severe ARDS category. Anything from uh, 100 to 200 would be moderate, and then anything 200 to 300 would be mild uh, ARDS. Now remember, this is only after you rule out all these other causes, right? You rule out cardiac insufficiency. You rule out all these other things, right? Oh yeah, so this is what I was just talking about. So you walked out of that memorized, guess what? So that's where you're looking at. Uh, all these patients need a baseline pressure just to make sure the lungs have somewhat pressure to keep them open. But you're doing this and you're looking at the PF ratio. And like I said, if it's 200 to 300, then it's mild. Uh, if you're looking at 100 to 200, it's moderate. And then anything less than 100, it's severe, right? So this is one of the things that will be trending with these patients day in and day out. He'll look at what their PF ratio is, 
And that's where the whole evidence behind prone ventilation, I think it was JAMA that published that, the Journal of American Medical Association that published that, if I remember right. I'll have to go back and verify that. Uh, on prone ventilation, uh, these patients were paralyzed uh, and prone, and they proned them, and, there was a, and they waited till I think, 150. Their PF ratio was 150. So they were in this sort of moderate area, and they would flip them over, and they would uh, have much better... Um, much better results with that uh, overall than just leaving them as they were and putting them on ECMO and all this other stuff. So and we'll talk about ECMO too, but the severity of ARDS is determined by the PF ratio. Do I expect you guys to do this ratio? Absolutely. Right? I will expect you to calculate this and do this. This is not a complicated calculation. You're just taking the P little AO2 over the FiO2 and dividing that's it right so you're just doing that the higher the number the more mild the condition right 200 to 300 right more mild it is if you have a pf ratio of 50 so let's just say their pao2 is 50 millimeters of mercury <laughs> and they're on a hundred percent oxygen right so we're doing the pf ratio here this means, because <laughs> that one goes away, their PF ratio is 50, which means they're in severe ARDS. So we got another patient. They're also on 100%, so 1.0, right? Remember, we shouldn't draw those subsequent numbers, but they're on 100% auction, so that's their FiO2. So what did I do? The FiO2, sorry. FiO2. And then let's say the patient, we flip them prone, so they had a PF ratio of 50. Now we flip them over, we draw a blood gas after 15, 20 minutes, right? And we see what their subsequent PO2 is. And now we have a P, uh, PO2 of 75. Well, now their new PF ratio is 75. So they're still in that severe category, but they're a lot better. Since the, the number is higher, that means they're not as severe. So it's like golf. <laughs> the higher the number, <laughs> wait, no, it's the opposite of golf. <laughs> but uh, the higher the number, the less severe the situation is going on. So I do expect you to do this. It is just division. That is it, right? So PO2 over FO2, and there is two examples for you. All right, so what's associated with ARDS? Remember, this is a syndrome. That's the S part, right? Acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's why I had syndrome on the front slide there. Right? A lot of complications. We already talked about barotrauma because it takes a lot of pressure to push open the alveoli. Well, that barotrauma isn't going to be on those areas that are collapsed. It's going to be the areas that are open. Remember the whole CT image of the lungs? You had like very radiolucent areas anteriorly and then very radio opaque posterior areas. Well, we're going to destroy these anterior segments with all that pressure. That's barotrauma, right? That's one of the things that we look at. So on these patients, and you do, I do expect you to have this memorized, we try to keep their plateau pressure under 30. And I don't, I know I want, I stress a lot of things. This is something that's evidence-based, and you need to make sure you remember this. The, the the fact that I'm making you memorize this now will make it easier for you when you get to mechanical ventilation. So we want to keep their plateau pressure, how much pressure it takes to extend their respiratory zone. This is measured on a ventilator. So if you're curious, how do I measure that? It's measured on a ventilator. So when we put this patient on a ventilator, this is one of the things that we're going to look at. And this pressure equates to how much pressure it takes to distend the respiratory zone. If we keep this pressure under 30, then that's lung protective ventilation. So we want to keep the distending pressure of the respiratory zone, which is the plateau pressure, under 30 centimeters of water. Right? So this is a key point. I could easily ask you this. Right, that's something I want to stress. So that's why we can put someone on 10 milliliters per kilo tidal volume. I could put a neuro, uh, neurosurgical patient, uh, a spinal cord injury patient on a tidal volume of 15 mLs per kilo. As long as their plateau pressure is less than 30, it could still be lung protective ventilation, right? Because we want to avoid damaging 
that respiratory zone and keeping it under 30 avoids barotrauma or damaging that respiratory zone right so that's where we talked about the alveoli that get disturbed are they going to be your anterior ones or your your ones that are already open so that's what we're looking at here uh, volume trauma is where we over distend to them where the alveoli is here and then we put a lot of pressure in there and the alveoli expands it's like okay I can expand a little bit and now it's expanding way too much right it's about ready to pop right so this is that volume trauma where it goes and expands too much and it can actually cause scar tissue forming all that bad stuff so barotrauma and volume trauma both they're not the same thing they both can happen especially in the those anterior segments of a patient is supine right less common if their tidal volume ventilation is low and we keep their plateau pressure less than 30 right keep that plateau pressure less than 30 ICU delirium uh, is something that we've got to be aware of. A lot of these patients will be required to be put on paralytics. Remember, what happens with your metabolic rate and your oxygen consumption when we chemically paralyze you, right? It goes down, and so therefore the oxygen can be utilized by your vital organs more efficiently. So your fingers, your toes, like those things, don't get um, – don't – consume as much oxygen so more is left over for your vital organ system so uh, because we're paralyzing heavily that's why I'm putting this in here because we're paralyzing heavily you it's unethical to paralyze without sedation so imagine you laying in your bed and being paralyzed but fully aware of everything around you you can feel pain you can feel touch you can feel everything you just can't move anything right and so there there's that anxiety component to it as well so we have to use sedation with paralytics uh, to avoid being cruel to these patients and so that can lead to ICU delirium as well that's something you'll talk about in advanced mechanical ventilation um, deep vein thrombosis that's why you've seen that one patient and I made a point to look at her compression stockings like that Ted hose that was on that patient um, and this is helping avoid a DVT from developing because do you think they're moving their their feet and their toes and their calves much no so is this patient at a higher chance for developing a thrombus that could then go to an emboli pulmonary emboli absolutely right uh, GI bleeding can easily happen on these patients right uh, stress ulcers especially when we're looking at what's going on with their stomach mucosa and we'll go over that in a different uh, I think that's critical care uh, critical care class as well we'll go into the GI stuff as well and I think we covered this a little bit in your regular AMP class too all right so a patient has ARDS what are some interventions of course oxygen therapy high FIO2s whatever it takes to get their their saturations adequate or their PAO2s adequate volume expansion just be careful right um, we could try to offset consolidation and electasis, but traditionally, remember that gas is going to path the least resistance to those areas that are already open. So you be careful. We want to keep that plateau pressure low, otherwise we're causing ventilator-induced lung injury. So be careful with volume expansion therapy. Now let's say this person was an ARDS and then they, they got extubated, they're on just lots of oxygen now, high flow cannula then maybe we can look at volume expansion therapies like PEPs things like that that will really help them recover more effectively uh, low tidal volume ventil ventilation strategy now I put a link to the ARDS net ventilation strategy in your resources tab of course so look at your resources tab um, so you can look at that and they're just real quick it's a PDF and it actually shows you exactly how we run a ventilator now I'm expecting you guys to memorize that no I just want you to be aware that you have that resource and then take a peek right see what it looks like now and then you'll be a lot more familiar with it when you get to that with me mechanical ventilation uh, paralytics of course we talked about that obviously they have to be on a ventilator if you're going to paralyze otherwise they won't be able to breathe right when you paralyze them so they got to be on a ventilator so the ventilator is breathing for them but that's going to help reduce their oxygen consumption it make them more effective whatever oxygen can get into their bloodstream it will be able to be distributed a lot better uh, to their vital organs and keep their kidneys, their heart, their brain 
all those organs alive. And that's, like I said, one of the biggest things about ARDS, coming back to like the very first slide, one of the biggest things about ARDS is they don't usually die of pulmonary insufficiency. They die of multi-organ system failure because we could not get enough oxygen to their organs, right? And so a lot of times we put tons and tons of pressure, right? So we have our lungs, we put tons and tons of pressure into their lungs as much as we can, right? To help expand this lung tissue to get better oxygen, right? But remember there's these two vessels, the superior and inferior vena cava that lead to this heart thing over here. And when we push a lot of pressure into the thoracic space, when we hyper expand the lung tissue, what happens to the vena cava that's in the chest wall? Right? It gets crushed. So we're seeing a crushing of the vena cava. It's pretty severe. So what happens to this patient's blood pressure as a result of too much thoracic pressure? If we have a low blood pressure, do you think we're going to be able to send a lot of blood to the kidneys? If we're not able to send a lot of blood to the kidneys, what happens to urine output? What happens with our body's ability to clear toxins? Right? So if we're not able to perfuse those kidneys well enough and you start to see their renal function decrease, that's a bad sign their blood pressure is going down, especially if they're entitled to CO2. And I will talk to you big time about that in critical care medicine. Their entitled CO2 is going down as well. That's a big sign that we might be causing hyperexpansion that's causing their blood pressure to be low, that's causing their renal function to be low, which then is causing more toxins to build up in their system, which is causing them to go into multi-organ system failure. I hope you got that, right? This is a big, big deal. So if you start to see this trend going on, right, the end tidal CO2 is going down, their blood pressure is going down, their renal function is going down, that's a sign you need to check yourself, right? You could be causing this right, your machine. We've already talked at nauseum about prone ventilation. Hopefully you've gotten the importance of that. Uh, fluid bolus, I love this one. So this is um, for patients um, with severe ARDS, they might give them like a liter of fluid. And we're not talking about a lot of fluid, just like a liter or a half liter. Uh, if their oxygen, if their PF ratio gets really low, let's say it gets to 50, one of the tools that the critical care doctor might use is give them a fluid bolus. And what they do here is they give them fluids, like a fluid bolus, to give them more CPAP or more distending pressure in their capillaries. Now we're not giving them enough to cause pulmonary edema, right? We're just giving them a little bolus. And what this does is this improves the VQ ratio. In other words, we're sending more perfusion through the capillaries. We have more red blood cells that are able to go through the capillaries because we distended. We caused some capillary distension here. Because we did that, more red blood cells are able to pick up, right? Just like CPAPing someone with obstructive apnea with, we're just stenting open that blood vessel. We're able to pick up oxygen and drop off some CO2 there. So it's not a permanent fix, but every once in a while, just a good little fluid bolus, especially if the patient's kidneys are not performing well and their blood pressure is low, that fluid bolus can really help not only oxygenate them, but also improve their renal function as well too. Uh, ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So outside the corpse or outside the body, we're gonna take the blood out Oxygenate it, put it back in. There's two types. Well, there's more than two types, but just for your purposes, there's venous venous and venous arterial. Uh, and so when we're looking at venous venous, we take it out of a vein and we put it back into a vein and we oxygenate in the meantime. Um, so that's where you're just bypassing the lungs. And then there's VA where you bypass the lungs and the heart. So if someone has a really sick heart, they might do VA ECMO as well. And so you'll go into that in your later courses. But the evidence behind ECMO shows if the earlier you do it in this patient's care, the better the outcomes, right, overall. So there's some hospitals that don't have the ability to do ECMO at all, and that's okay. 
Uh, other hospitals that they do it, they try to do it early on in their ARDS process because the survivability rate's much better the earlier you initiate it. So that's where it becomes an issue. At what point do you say, oh, prone ventilation's fine, we don't need to do this? And then the other part's like, well, the evidence suggests best results if we do ECMO early on. This is where it gets into a whole patient by patient situation. The care team has to weigh in on this. All right, some quick review questions. I know this is long. Uh, what are some common lung alterations that occur with the ARDS? There are a lot of them. <laughs> what are they? What might you find? This patient at the bedside, they show up, they had, uh, they vomited and aspirated a bunch of this stuff where they have a viral pneumonia that's causing their ARDS. What would their patient assessment look like? Tachypnea, tachycardia, cyanosis, uh, arrhythmias, weird mucus, uh, breath sounds, would they be bronchial? Would they be vesicular? Would they be crackly? Would they be wheezy? Would they be clear? Would they be distant? What would their breath sounds be, right? Uh, what about their x-ray? Anything abnormal? What about the blood gas? What about their oxygenation? Shunt-like? DO2? Venusat. What about their metabolic consumption if they're in something like sepsis that caused their ARDS? What would happen with their VO2 and their O2ER? On these patients, what type of process is going on? Right, Restrictive, obstructive, both? What is going on here? How would we trend their PFTs? What would happen with their DLCO, which is how easy it is to get oxygen from inside the alveoli to inside the capillary? What would happen with their DLCO? What are the stages and definitions again? I'm thinking of an equation here. I'm thinking of mild, moderate, severe, and an equation that you will probably have to calculate and know the normals for mild, moderate, and severe. All right, someone with ARDS, what are some therapeutic interventions that we can use? Airway clearance therapy, bronchodilators, PEP. What are some therapies we can use? Patient positioning, is that an option? Hopefully this stuff is sort of coming together to you. I know this is a long presentation, but this is a very important subject and I want you guys, especially if you're gonna work critical care medicine and emergency medicine, pay attention to ARDS. This is one area that I know I want you to be up in all the areas, but if you're going to work critical care, especially at a level one trauma center or something like that, I want you to be very familiar with all the different idiosyncrasies of ARDS. It is a syndrome, it's not a disease, but it's a very important one to be able to recognize early and to be able to take the right steps early. And I will put a lot of links for you under the resources tab uh, as well. So that way you can enhance your education on ARDS that much more. Very important subject.